So you can think of asymptotic analysis. All right, asymptotic analysis. And the, uh, especially in the context here, um, as, it is, as a means of describing the efficiency of an algorithm as the input size um, into that algorithm approaches infinity. And so when I say like input size, what do I mean by that? Uh, it's probably clear to you or maybe it's not, but you know, input size differs based on the problem being solved. Um, for example, uh, we're going to talk in, you know, about sorting and you know a few videos ahead but sorting is a is a com is a fundamental problem in computer science um, and the input here is going to be um, you know a list of numbers and so when I talk about asymptotic analysis on sorting what I'm really wanting to know is okay if I have an algorithm that's going to sort a list of numbers like two three one five and six if these are my a list of numbers, and I have an algorithm that's going to you know to sort them into one, two, three, five, and six as such, because we're sorting in ascending order in this example, then maybe it works well. Maybe it works just fine on a on a list of numbers. It's one, two, three, four, five items in size. That's what I mean by input size. So the input size here would be five, but maybe something terrible happens whenever we blow you know balloon the input size up to um you know i don't know like a million like what if we had a list of numbers that was a million in size you know that's that's way too big to even draw on the screen into relative size and so if we had like one million that is something that's sort of you know not easy to even think about and one our algorithm could be you know, uh, could be inefficient for input sizes of this of this of this size, and so what we like to do is we like to analyze an algorithm and say, hey, um, what is the running time of this? What is the running time of this algorithm? And running time is the um, you can think of it as the number of steps as a function of let me write that a little bit neater as a function of input size. And so in this case, we had five and then we moved up to a million. Can we express the running time of our algorithm, how many steps it has to take as a particular function? For example, if we had a function that was, you know, I'm going to write an example here. What if we had a function that was n squared? Well, that means that if you give me an input of size n, let's just say that uh, n was equal to 10. Well, if n was equal to 10, then our, our particular algorithm would take n squared time, which would be 10 squared. All right, it'd take 10 squared te steps at most, and that would be 100 steps. And maybe that's fine for a size 10, but if it was a million, it would take a million squared steps to complete, and that's a really long time. That's a, that's a lot of steps, and so maybe our computers can't handle that, and we need to come up with a better algorithm. And so if you took um, Math Fundamentals for Algorithms, or you watch those videos, uh, it's, it's probably, you know, you're probably comfortable with thinking about, you know, our pro a program um, and the number of steps that it needs to take as the input size grows, all the way from n equals 1 to n equal 2. You know, let's imagine this is actually 1 million. You know, if we had an algorithm that was n squared, it would it would grow in a in a quadratic fashion like that. And maybe we would we would really really appreciate an algorithm that was you know linear instead of n squared. It'd be like n. And maybe our computer can handle this, but it it really can't handle this. It takes too long. And so the that that's sort of the gist of asymptotic analysis. We're going to jump into not only some notation, but also some methods for analyzing algorithms after this. So there's some common notations that we should be aware of if we're going to uh, analyze our algorithms. And so the first one that I want to talk about is big O. It's probably a better way to write it, O notation. And explain what it is. And so what this is, you can just think of just when you see big O like this, just think upper bound. 
okay? And what I mean by that is that, you know, I've explained that a program can be analyzed by the number of steps, hypothetically, you know, steps, like actual steps that it takes, as the input size varies, you know, n all the way up to n equal to uh, some number, like 1 million. And beforehand, remember, we had like a quadratic, you know, growing algorithm, and we said n squared, that you give me an input size, we had some algorithm, we said if you give me an input size of size n, it's going to take approximately n squared steps to complete this algorithm. And so what big O notation does is it, 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 it says that, okay, if I say that I have an algorithm that's big O of n squared, what I mean here, f of n, let's just say this is the actual running time of our algorithm f of n, like the actual function for our algorithm, let's just say it's like this, right? It's going to be less than or equal to some constant c times n squared. And this is going to be uh, past a certain point uh, n naught, right? So like at a certain point, our function, like our algorithm, is going to be upper bounded by n squared all the way into infinity. So let me draw this again. Let's imagine our algorithm did like this, that it was actually higher than n squared for a really long time. And then there's a crossover period where it did like this. So you can see like in this period, our algorithm is actually taking longer than n squared. n squared is not upper bounded. It does not provide a, a, a good upper bound, but here, n squared is going to be greater greater than f of n for, I mean, the foreseeable future all the way up into infinity. And since we're doing asymptotic analysis, that's why, uh, you know, we're thinking about it this way. But essentially, it's saying that, okay, past a certain point n naught all the way up to infinity, our function that represents the number of steps that our al algorithm actually will do, that really will do, is always going to be less than or equal to some constant c times I'm sorry, n squared. And so this function right here will forever, this function right here will forever upper bound this function. And that's what big O of n squared means. So if I have an algorithm, if, if, if our algorithm is represented by some function f of n, right? Um, if I say that this algorithm is represented, number of steps is represented by f of n on some input size, is O of n squared, then that means that you can think of it this way, is that there's a certain point, there's some point in not some input size that past that input size all the way up to infinity, this function n squared, um, or actually this right here, c of n squared for some constant c, will always upper bound our function, which represents the running time of our algorithm. And so that's big O notation. And so another notation to think about is the opposite, and it's actually called Omega, big omega notation. And this is a lower bound. Okay, and so if we imagine we had this, if I say that f of n represents the number of steps as our algorithm, if I say our algorithm is, uh, you know, f of n, this number of steps, for any input size n, is omega of n squared. Well, this means the exact opposite than what we saw beforehand. If this is n squared, right, then our algorithm is actually probably going to look like this. It can look like this, actually. Maybe it's like this, and maybe this is a little bit sharper of a term. Uh, this Maybe this is our algorithm, right? And we're saying that F, big, o no, uh, big O notation said that past a certain point, the, that your function, your your algorithm, the number of steps it's going to take on a particular input size is an upper is upper bounded by this function. This can say it's lower bounded by it, and so this is saying that, okay, that for that f of n, all right, it's going to be strictly it's going to be greater than or equal to c times n squared, uh, you know, for some n naught, right? So you can see like our function right here. There's a certain point in not where our function was it looks like it will forever especially if it had this little sharp upturn right here will forever be lower bounded by n squared and so it's safe to say that that our function that represents the number of steps that our, our algorithm 
uh, is forever lower bounded by n squared past a certain point n naught up to you know some constant of proportionality, and that's all the way into infinity. And that's what that means. So if you have an algorithm, if you had a sorting algorithm that's omega of n squared, that means there's some input size, n naught, that past that input size, your algorithm is going, the number of steps it's going to take to complete its task of sorting, is going to be lower bounded by n squared for infinity, no matter how big the input size is past this n naught, up to some constant of proportionality like 3n squared or 7n squared or something like that. And so the last one I want to talk about is theta notation. And I like to think of this one as the sandwich. And pretty much all this is saying is that if I have some algorithm, uh, this is, now think of this, this is both an upper and a lower bound. You will, you will see this more than uh, omega, depending upon your course, but I think just in general you'll see it more than omega. Um, and so what this is saying is that if I have an f of, if I have a function f of n and it is o, theta of n squared, like we're using our same example, then that means that f of n is going to be greater than c1 times n squared, and then another t constant c2 times n squared. Okay, and this is for like this is for some like n naught. Okay, um, at some point it's going to be sandwiched by this function. So if I have, ooh, I can do a better job. So if this right here is our algorithm's running time, f of n, and this is going to be c2, okay, n squared, and then this is going to be c1, n squared. Um, and then this is probably going to be the point right here where both of them, that's what it looks like how I've drawn it, this is a point right here where past this point all the way up to infinity you see the rate that it's growing if I draw a little bit more of a tail on this you can see that it's gonna outgrow f of n all the way up to infinity these two functions c2 times n squared c1 times n squared they're always going to provide upper and lower bounds to f of n f of n is always gonna be sandwiched between it and so all the way out into infinity you can see like c n squared is gonna be up here f of n is going to be here, c1 n squared is going to be up here, and they're always going to be, f of n is always going to be um, sandwiched in between these two functions. And that's what theta of n squared means. So let's talk about the master method. And so sometimes the master method was created whenever our algorithm that we made uh, falls into a, a pretty little box. Um, and it's used to analyze what are called divide and conquer algorithms specifically. Where divide and conquer is an algorithm that takes a problem, let's just say it's a, a list of numbers like such, a hypothetical list of numbers. A divide and conquer algorithm is going to take it and divide it into subcomponents, right? Let me draw that a little bit better. And then it's going to keep on dividing it Right until you get down to uh, this, the problem, the size is so small. It's like a size one here, and it just it just fun like elementary like it just solves it. And so, and then once that it solves that portion, it kind of bounces back up and solves this one. And and that's an example of divide and conquer. And there's actually an algorithm called merge merge sort that this diagram you know pretty closely explains how it how it does its its divide and conquer steps. But that's divide and conquer. We're taking a problem, we're dividing it up into smaller and smaller subproblems, and then we solve them once they get small enough, and then we solve them from the ground up. Solve the original bigger problem. But it's meant to solve recurrences. These are recursive functions uh, that can be used to represent the number of steps that a divide and conquer algorithm actually does. And we'll use it. We'll use it to analyze algorithms in the future. Um, but essentially what this means is that this is the same thing. This function is the same thing as saying that we have some function, some algorithm, that at each step it's going to divide the problem into a different subparts, and each subpart is going to be of size n over b. And so, and then for each subproblem, sorry, it's going to do f of n work. And so, what do I mean? A subproblems of size n over b, and there's f of n work. 
Well, let's imagine that we had uh, t of n is equal to 3, where a is 3, 3 times t n over 3 plus n. Uh, well, what would this look like? Well, first off, this, this right here, this is the same thing as writing out this, this t of n is the same as this t of n prime. It's the same thing as t over n over 3 plus t of n over 3 plus t of n over 3 plus n. This is just a more compact way of writing this. We don't want to write it out like that. And so here, and in, in, we're just going to focus our attention here, a is 3, b is 3, and then f of n is equal to just n. And so what does this look like? Um, I'm going to actually, I'm going to keep this you know, longer written function here just for reference, but this, you can imagine this tree of being like, okay, if we drew the recursion tree where we had n at the top, uh, you're going to pass it into this function and it's going to create a subproblem of size n over 3. It's going to get passed into the same function, another one of n over 3, and then another one of n over 3, etc. And then it's going to keep, you know, this one right here would be t of n over 9. And then it's going to continue doing that all the way down. And so the master method, right, before we've talked about previously how to analyze these algorithms that create recursion trees like this, recursive functions using a recursion tree by looking at the number of work done per level, the number of levels of the tree, and then analyzing it that way. But, you know, the master method is there so that we don't have to do that. Um, we can just, if the algorithm fits into like this pretty little box, then we can just use uh, a set of pre-built functions to, to asymptotically analyze it. And so what am I talking about when I mean the master method? Um, this is the master method. So if we have a recursive function of that format that we had above, then, and it falls into these three cases, case one is it's going to be theta of n to the log base b of a, okay, if case one, if, this is case one, if the function f of n, this is this function over here, if f of n, right there, Okay, is equal to this to big O of n to the log base b of a minus some epsilon uh, where you know epsilon is greater than zero and I'll explain all this shortly case two this is case one case two is going to be it's going to be theta of n to the log base b the log base b of a log n if f of n is equal to theta of n log b of a. And it's essentially saying it's like equal to this. If f of n is equal to uh, this right here. And then case three, uh, it's just going to be theta of f of n. Okay. If f of n, all right, is omega it's lower bounded, remember that, by n log b a plus some epsilon, okay, for epsilon greater than zero. And there's like a, a caveat, and, okay, a times f over n over b is less than or equal to some constant times f of n for c strictly greater than, one, strictly less than one, sorry. It's very important. And so let's talk about our first example. I'm going to scroll down, but we can always reference back up, and I will. Our first example is this one. Let's use our example from above. t of n is equal to 3 times t of n over 3 plus n. And so this is our original function that we used above. Um, and so let's analyze it, right? So we have a is equal to 3. We know that to be true. This is a. We have b is also equal to 3, it's right there. And then we have f of n, right, is equal to n. This is our f of n. And so let's use the master method. And so what we do is we go up to the top and we say, okay, so all of these, right, cases depend on if you analyze f of n, right? So what you do is you do the n log b of a on f of n. It's, it's in, and compare it to f of n. 
And so the, the n log b of a, and we're going to compare this to f of n, is going to be n to the log base 3 of 3. Well, that's 1. So it's equal to n. And so f of n is equal to n, right? And so we know that f of n is equal to this, right? n log b of a. And which case would that be? So in this first case, we're saying that, okay, if f of n is equal to big O of n log b of a minus some epsilon, we're not going to worry about the epsilon. That means if f of n is less uh, n log b of a. So, and then number two, we're saying, okay, f of n is equal to theta of n log b of a. And I wrote the equal sign here. And this is the case we fall into because f of n is equal to n log b of a. That's how you can read that, if it's equal to n log b of a. I wrote it formally here, but this is how you can kind of think about it in our examples. If f of n is equal to n log b of a, then case two applies. And this is the asymptotic running time of it, n log b of a log n. Um, which in our case, is we're gonna write n log b of a is n, and then log n is our running time. And so we can say t of n, is equal to theta of n log n. Oops, sorry. Theta of n log n. And so where log here in our case is, it's just the same thing as saying n log base three of n, right? Because we're dividing into three subproblems. And uh, if you wrote out the recursion tree, that's that's the same you know, you got three you know you got three sub problems per level and then you're going to have log base three of n levels until eventually you get down to the sub problems that are too small and then you have n work per level right so three problems per level log uh, log three log base three of n levels and then n work per level but here look at this function t of n four sorry times t of n over two so we got four subproblems all of size n over two plus n squared log n. Let's think about this. So a right here is gonna be four, b is gonna be two, right? And then we have f of n is going to be n squared log n. Where I mean log base two here. Um, and so Let's analyze, let's look at what n log b of a is, because we know that matters, because we're comparing it to f of n. n log b of a is going to be n log base 2 of 4. Well, this is 2. And so n log b of a is n squared. And we're saying that, okay, well, in this case, n log b of a is less than or equal to f of n, right? Because n squared is going to be less than or equal to the log of n. And so we can say that case three applies, right? Um, because, well, because we do have that f of n, our actual function f of n is omega of this. You would say that, you could, you could think, well, you could think of it that way. You could say it's lower bounded than by it, right? Because n squared log n is greater than or equal to n squared. And so it is kind of logical to think that it's omega of the, of the um, n log b of a function that we had. So this is n log b of a, this is our f of n. We can say f of n is larger than n squared. It's n squared, uh, log n is larger than n squared. But the problem is, is that there's a caveat, and the caveat is that when, when applying these functions, right, when applying these functions to the, you know, to the master method, or applying the master method to these functions, if we're looking at case one, for example, we wanna make sure that f of n is not only less than or equal to n log b of a, because uh, I have this less than or equal to sign here for a reminder. We want to make sure that it's polynomially smaller. So we want to make sure that f of n is polynomially less than or equal to n log b of a. So if f of n is n squared, we want to make sure that n log b of a, uh, n log base b of a, is n cubed, not n squared log n. And the same thing here, well, actually this is equal to it, but the same thing here, we want to make sure that f of n is greater than or equal to n log b of a, but polynomially larger than n log b of a. And here, if you can see this, this is not polynomially larger than n log b of a. You know, n log b of a is n squared, f of n is n squared over log n, and so if you take n squared log n and divide it by n squared, you get log 
of n. And log of n is not a polynomial, is not polynomial larger. And so the master method actually does not apply here. You would have to do something like a recursion tree uh, or you know other methods to analyze this algorithm. And so I wanted to give you a non-example and an actual example. And so uh, that is the master method in a nutshell. So in this video, I want to talk about the maximum subarray problem, and we're going to we're going to devise an algorithm to help solve it. So first, you know, we're talking about divide and conquer algorithms here, and this is a divide and conquer algorithm, or at least the the, the solution I'm going to show you is. And so, what is the problem? So the problem is is that you know you're given as input uh, a list of numbers or an array of numbers, and I've given you you know this example here, and they're positive or negative integers. And your goal is to find uh, the subarray, the subarray that the items within the subarray, their sum is the highest across all different subarrays in the array. And so here, this subarray has the items two, the numbers two, negative one, zero, and three. And so its sum is one plus three, it's four. And that's the sum of this subarray. Now, is this the maximum subarray across the entire input? Uh, input array, we don't know. And that's why we have this algorithm. And so before we go into the steps of the algorithm and why it's a divide and conquer algorithm, let's, let's first talk about how it even came about. And so this entire algorithm is spawned from these three inarguable facts. One, if there is a maximum subarray, it's entirely, it's either one case is that it's entirely in first half, right? It's entirely in the first half of the array. And so you can't really argue that. If there is a maximum subarray, one possibility is that it's entirely in the first half of the array. The second one is that it's entirely, I really didn't have to write that again, but entirely in the second half, right? Where it's entirely over here. And that's true. If we do have a maximum subarray, it's either entirely in the first half or it's entirely in the second half, where the half is determined by a midpoint. You know, here we have eight items, and so the midpoint would be right here. And so this would be the first half, and then this would be the second half. And so now that we have that in our brains, we have one more fact. If there is a maximum subarray, then it's either entirely in the first half, entirely in the second half, or it crosses write that a little bit better, it crosses the midpoint. And so what that means is we already talked about what a midpoint was just a second ago. Let's say this is the midpoint. It's either got some of its items in the left half and then some of its items in the right half. And so if there is a maximum subarray, it's either in the first half and the second half or it crosses the midpoint. That these are three inarguable facts, and from these, an entire divide and conquer algorithm that I'm about to show you uh, spurs. So I fast forwarded a little bit, and I wrote our list of numbers, our array of numbers again. And so diving into the algorithm here, what we're going to do, how the maximum subarray algorithm works, is that we're going to recursively divide uh, this list of numbers into a its left half, its right half, and then also into just the just the problem itself, just the array itself, um, to be able to solve our three facts. We want to be able to solve what's the maximum subarray that exists only in the left half, what's the maximum subarray that exists only in the right half, and what's the maximum subarray that crosses the midpoint here. And so let's get down to figuring out how the divide and conquer algorithm works. And so what we're going to do is we're going to first divide it into a left half. We're going to take its left half, we're going to peel it off, and we're going to break it up. Move it over here. Then we're going to break off the right half and, and move it over here. And then we're going to, because uh, we're solving the left half, we're solving the right half, and then now we're going to solve the, the, the maximum, cross, maximum subarray that crosses the midpoint. And so we're just going to take the entire array and bring it down here to, to solve that problem. Make one and then two. All right.
righty. And so we're just going to focus on the the left, the, the pro sub problem that was created by breaking and taking off the left half. What we're going to do is we're going to keep on dividing. We're going to divide this into the just the left half. We can make that a little bit smaller. And we're going to divide this into the right half, 0 and 3. Okay, and then we're just going to break off and solve the midpoint. The midpoint crossing subarray. Awesome. So we have the left, we have the right, and we have the mid. And then we're going to keep on doing it. Uh, so we're going to divide this problem all the way down till we get to a point where the problem is so trivial, uh, like singletons here, and it's just it's way too it's really easy to solve, and we solve it from the ground up. And so if we're looking at just this problem right here, this is where we stop. We can't break this problem up anymore. Um, and we're, we're not going to break this up because we're trying to solve the midpoint here. And what we do is we say, okay, the, the largest subarray that's in the left half of this array right here is, is 2. It's the only item that can be in there, so for sure is the largest one. And the largest subarray that exists only in the right half is negative 1 here because uh, it's the only one that can be in the right half of this problem. And then the largest subarray that crosses the midpoint, where the midpoint is right here, has to be the entire array itself because you have to have some items in the left when the only item on the left is two. You have to have some items on the right and the only item that's in the uh, in, in the right that's that's uh, is negative one. And so the entire array is the the one the largest subarray crossing the midpoint. And then now you have these three subarrays, and now this at this problem you have to make a decision. You have to elect uh, the maximum subarray. And the one in the left half, its sum is obviously two because it's only two. The one in the right half is negative one, and then the one that's in the that's crossing the midpoint, the sum is one. And so the maximum subarray here, the one that has the highest sum of the elements that's in it, is going to be just the subarray just that exists in the left half, which is only two. And so cleaning up my space a little bit here, now we switch colors. The subarray that got chosen here was the one that exists solely in the left half, just two. And we're going to do the same thing over here to this problem. And you know, I don't have to. Hopefully, I don't have to draw this out. You can see that this is going to get broken up into uh, the left half is going to be just zero. The right half is just going to be three, and the largest subarray crossing the midpoint is going to be both of these. And so. The, the largest subarray here is going to be a tie between the one that's in just the right half, 3, or the one that's crossing the midpoint, 0 and 3. And just to keep things fun, let's just go ahead and choose the, the one that crosses the midpoint. And that's going to be the entire array. Okay, and so now we need to solve this problem. So this is where things get interesting. How do we find the largest subarray that crosses the midpoint? Well, first we need to elicit a midpoint, which is right here, hopefully we can agree. We've got two on the left and two on the right. And you know what we do is we, we start by just figuring out how far off the midpoint do we have to go to the left? How many items in the left subarray should we include? And we solve the left side first. And what we do is we start here and we go, well, we have to include the first one for it to even have an item in the left su uh, subarray and account, you know, and actually be a subarray that crosses the midpoint. And we keep track of two things. We keep track of our running sum, and then we keep track of our maximum sum, right? And we also keep track of the index that we left off with the maximum sum. In here, you can see that, okay, negative one, that's got to include that. And so our maximum sum right now is negative one. And then we keep track of its, its index, which is at this point, it's going to be one because we're, you know, doing zero index. And so that's going to be one. And then, you know, we, we scoot over here and we go, okay, does adding two to our left side, does that increase our maximum sum? Um, one, we know that our running sum is now one. And did it increase our maximum sum? And the answer is yes. It, it went up to from negative one to one. And so we, we move, we change our max index to be zero on the left side. And at this point, we have no more items to consider. And the maximum subarray that crosses the midpoint the portion of it that exists in the left just so happens to be every single item that's in this left half. And then we do the same thing for the right side. And so I'm going to clean up my space a little bit. Let me see. Well, actually, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep this because this was helpful. And so we start over here, and I'm going to remove this cursor. It's a pointer. 
And we're going to start here, and we're going to go, okay, we have to include 0, so the sum is 0, our maximum sum is 0, and then our index is 0, 1, 2 here on the right side. And we go, okay, let's include, th let's see what 3 does. Well, 3 is actually going to increase our sum from 0 to 3, our maximum sum from 0 to 3. And the max index on the right side now gets moved up to 3. And so now we have the left side that ended here and the right side that ends over here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to wind up choosing every single uh, item that's in this array as the maximum element, uh, maximum subarray, oops, sorry, maximum subarray that crosses the midpoint. And, you know, this is very interesting because, you know, I was, uh, and I want to explain some something right here is that let's just say that we, you know, we, we start off by including this element on the right side. And let's just say that this was not three, but it was negative three. Well, the thing is, is that if this was negative three, um, what we're going to do is we're going to not include it because it decreases our maximum sum. And so now we're at the, we're trying to solve this problem. We have the left side, it has a sum of two. We have the maximum subarray on the right side as a sum of three. We have the maximum subarray that crosses the midpoint, which is, uh, you know, uh, two minus one is one plus zero plus three is four. And then we need to decide, is it the left, right, or the midpoint that has the highest uh, sub maximum subarray in this left side that we brought down right here? And the answer is the one that crosses the, the midpoint. And so that is the one that gets chosen. It is the one, it is the, actually the entire array in this, in this situation. And so, you know, I'm not going to draw it out here because we don't have the space, but we do this same, this same breakup right here of the problem. We solve this side the same way. Now, when I was first learning this algorithm, there was two things that confused me. Um, or there was one thing that confused me mainly was that, okay, we break up this problem, you know, the left side this way. We break up the right side the same way into left, right, and mid, and then so on. But the, the problem that actually, the subproblem that it solves the midpoint crossing array doesn't get broken up. We solve it the same way, and I want to point that out, is that we, we solve it as it is. Um, and so we don't keep breaking this up into, you know, left, right, and mid. You know, we don't do that. We stop right here, we solve the midpoint crossing or subarray, and then we, we bounce back up. So we just took a deep dive into the maximum subarray algorithm, and now let's analyze it to see what, what is the running time of this algorithm. And so remember, what we're going to do is that on any input of size n, we're going to break it up into three problems. We're going to take the left half, and then we're going to break it up in, you know, this is going to be of size n over 2, and we're going to recursively solve that side. We're going to break up the right side, and that's going to be of size n over 2 as well. And then we're going to take the entire array itself of size n, and then we are going to find the uh, midpoint. And that's, this subproblem is going to be of size n the maximum array that subarray that crosses the midpoint. And then we're going to continue on these left and right subarrays by, you know, breaking them up into, uh, you know, smaller and smaller subarrays. Uh, the left one is going to be of size n over 4 because it's half of n over 2. The right one is going to be of size n over 4 because it's half of n over 2. And then we're going to solve the, um, the midpoint crossing subarray, which is going to be of size n over 2. And remember, we do not uh, recursively break these down. And so we're going to continue doing that. We do that on the right side as well, and we don't do it here like I just said. And so this is the basic tree of how things work with this algorithm. And so if you think about it, if we go back to our recursion trees, we said that the total cost of, a, of an algorithm, the total running time of an algorithm, is made up of the, it's the number of work per level of a recursive algorithm. It's the number of work per level times the number of levels. Well, the, the number of levels here since we are dividing the problem by a size 2, is going to be the log base 2 of n. And a little thing that I learned some t one time that is actually very helpful is that the log base 2 of any number, so the log base 2 of any number n, uh, let me write that a little bit better, log base 2 of n, the log base 2 of any number is the number of times you can divide this number by 2 before you get uh, down to 1 or less than or equal to 1. For example, if the log base 2 of 8 is 3, because 2 raised to the third is, is 8, 2 raised to the 3 is 8, and you can also take 8 and divide it by 2 exactly 3 times 
same answer as a log base two of eight. And so the num the log base it's a it's an approximate estimate, but the log base uh, b of n, the log base b of n is equal to the number of times you can divide n by b before you get to a number that's less than or equal to one. And so hopefully that helps you analyze the fact that, okay, if we're dividing this problem by two and we're going to stop once it gets to uh, problems of size one, then how many times are we going to have to be able to divide it by two before we get down to that size? That's the log base two of n. And then we needed the work, right, per level. Okay, well the work per level here for these problems, we're just recursively dividing them, right? We're just, we're not doing anything, we're just chopping them in half and, and taking them down to this level. And so the work per level is going to be of n, where n is the size of the input. So the input here to solving the midpoint was of size n over 2, and so the work here was n over 2, the work over here was n. And so for this level right here, there's going to be n work here, and then for this level here, there's going to be n over 2 work here, and then obviously we're going to break this one up the same way. It's going to be of size n over 2, and then these are going to get broken up recursively just like these are. And so the work here is going to be n over 2, and then this one does not get broken up like we said. And so the work on this side is, on this level, is n. And so the work per level is n, and to analyze the total, it's going to be the number of work per level times the number of levels, which is n log 2 of n, which you can say is, you know, uh, big O of n log base 2 of n, or theta of n log base 2 of n. Either way, let's just do theta of n, uh, n log base 2 of n, and this is the running time of our algorithm. And so we did the recursion tree. The recursion tree requires a lot of work. Uh, this is a recursive divide and conquer algorithm, so we can actually apply the master method to solve this a lot easier. And so let's do that. And we'll show that we get the same answer. And so we can actually use these inputs. A is equal to 2 because there's two subproblems created, two recursively solved subproblems created at each level. The midpoint crossing subarray is not recursively solved, it's solved right then and there. B is going to be the how, how much we're dividing. We're dividing the problem by 2 each step, so B is going to be 2. And then F of N, well that's the work that we're doing to solve the, the cr midpoint crossing subarray, and that's going to be uh, just N. You know, it's linear in the number of items because if we're trying to, if you remember when we we're solving the midpoint, we're going to you know, literally scan all the way to the left side, you know, leaving off where we had the maximum uh, subarray on the left side. And then we're going to scan all the way to the right side, leaving off where we have the maximum, you know, subarray that extended into the right side. And then we have our middle, but we had to scan through all items. And so the work per, uh, for the find the midpoint cross the subarray is of size, is, is n. We have to scan through all n items. And we can write this recursive algorithm like such. It's t times 2 of n over 2 plus n. And we can go ahead and just start applying the master method. You know, we analyze n log base b of a, which is going to be the n log base 2 of 2 here, which is just going to be 1, which is just n. And in this case, f of n is equal to n. That puts us in case 2. And so we have now that if you're in case two, if you remember, please reference back. Your running time is going to be theta of n log base two of n, right? Where, you know, our, our case is b of n. So this is our running time right here. And that's how you analyze the maximum subarray algorithm. And that's, that's, you know, it's really cool to see an application of the master method, how we actually build a recursion tree um, and we're able was able to sort of reason our way through the running time of this algorithm and then see how it's so easy if we can just put it into this pretty little box of the master method and see that it falls into case two and then walk away at the same running time without having to do all that work. And so that's how you analyze the maximum subarray algorithm. In this video, we're going to talk about bubble sort. And um, bubble sort is one of, the, I think, the most popular sorting algorithm that I can, that I can think of. And but it's it's widely known for being inefficient. And so I'm going to show you what bubble sort is before we talk about merge sort, which is a divide and conquer algorithm. And I'm going to show you with this this uh, five element example. And so the goal here is that we have five elements in this list. 
five numbers in this list, and I want to sort them in ascending order. There are three, one, five, two, four right now. I want one, two, three, four, five. And bubble sort is going to get me that answer, but it's going to do it in a very slow way. And so what happens is that we're going to talk about the first iteration of bubble sort. And remember, we're zero indexing things, and so we start with zero all the way up to four. And first what we're going to do is we're going to set a pointer, right, which is going to be i, and it's going to point to the first element. And then we're going to set another pointer, j, and it's going to point to the last element. And what we do is we, we work j down, like we iterate, we iterate, we iterate j down until we get right to the element that the, is right in front of i. And so we stop j right here. And now this is what we do, is that wherever j is, we're going to compare a of j with a of j minus 1, the index right before it. Now, if a of j is less than a of j minus 1, then we're going to swap them. And you can think of it this way. If we want to sort this list in ascending order, and a of j is actually less than this, then the, we know that these two numbers are out of order. But in this case, you know, 2 and 4, uh, 4 is actually greater than, than 2, and they're, they're in ascending order. And so we don't have to really do anything. There's no swapping. And so the array, when j is equal to 4, is going to uh, look like this. It's going to actually stay the same, right? And I'm going to write the array. And so what we do afterwards is we move j to 3. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to delete j and delete our pointer. And then we're going to move j down to 3. And then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say, is a of j less than a of j minus 1? And the answer is yes. So now we actually need to do some swapping. And so we need to swap where a of, j, uh, a of j with a of j minus 1 because they're out of order. We want ascending order, and these are obviously not in ascending order. And so we swap them, and then we're left with 3, 1, 2, 5, and 4. We swapped a, j, and a, j minus 1. Awesome. And then we iterate down. And so we get down here where a of j is equal to uh, 2. And I'm going to go down here to show this, but... We have a of j is equal to 2, right? And, you know, i is still equal here. i is still here. And what we do is we realize, okay, we see is a of j great, uh, less than a of j minus 1? And that is, uh, that, that is uh, not the case. Sorry, that is not the case. This is in sorted order. So we don't do anything. And so j equal to 2, when j is equal to 2, well, we just terminate what we had at j is equal to 3. And so this is what we have. And then we move j, um, and then at, that, at this point, we move j to uh, right here, and this is i. And then we say, okay, is a of j less than a of j minus 1? And that is the truth. They are out of order. And so at this point, what happens is when j is equal to 1, we, when that terminates, we are left with this array, 1, 3, 2, 5, and 4. Awesome. And at this point, we are done because we, we terminate with j right here, right, right in front of i. It doesn't go to i, but it terminates right in front of i. And then now we move the counter i. And this is what it's going to look like. I'm going to give myself some more real estate, keeping uh, this, this, array in, this array in mind right here is that what we do is now we move to i is equal to 1. When we move to i is equal to 1, uh, this is what the array originally looks like. I'm going to write it out. I'm just going to carry this down. It's going to start off like this. 1, 3, 2, 5, 4. Two, three, 4. Okay. And then i is right here. And then we start with j all the way down here, and we do the exact same thing. And so we compare aj with aj minus 1, and if aj is less than aj minus 1, then we swap it. And so when we have j is equal to um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in this case, when that terminates, sorry, when that terminates, we are left with 1, 3, 2. These two at the end get swapped. Okay. 
Awesome. And then we move on to j is equal to 3. Give myself a little bit more real estate. And you see the pattern here is that we have i here, we have j is here, and then we say is aj less than aj minus 1? It's not. And so when j is equal to 3, we're left with the same array. Nothing special here. But if you're probably seeing on the next iteration, we're going to have to make some changes. And so when j is equal to 2, right, what happens is, is i is here and then j is here. And we're actually going to stop at this point and just do this. This is going to be our last comparison. And we're going to say, okay, is j of j less, less than a of j minus 1? And that is the case. These are out of order right here. And then we swap them. And then we're left with a with 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And this array is already in sorted order, and so there's really no need to carry on, um, even though the algorithm would carry on, uh, unless you wrote something to stop it. But what happens is, is okay, now if we were to continue going, when i is equal to, um, you know, when i goes from 1 to 2, is that i would be here, and then we'd start j here, and then we'd go down, but we wouldn't make any changes because everything's in sorted order. And the, the thing about bubble sort is that you can now sort of see that Every time after when i increments, when, when i goes from i minus 1 to i, what happens is that everything behind i after we change it is in sorted order. And if we can, if we can assume that, right, I would, I would encourage you to prove that that is the case. But if we can assume that, then a pretty easy proof kind of comes out from that. Okay, so we're going to talk about merge sort. Uh, merge sort. is a divide and conquer sorting algorithm. So we've talked about a divide and conquer algorithm. We talked about the maximum subarray problem. And then we talked about a sorting algorithm, bubble sort, right? Bubble sort was really inefficient. It was n squared time. But now merge sort is going to marry up these two concepts of sorting and divide and conquer to be able to provide efficient sorting algorithm. And so as always, let's start with an example. Okay, so here's our list of numbers and I've drawn it to the, the best that I could. And here's the high level overview. So merge sort is going to, you know, cut the array in half because it's divide and conquer. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the left half of the array, we're gonna break it off. And this looks very similar to maximum subarray if you watch those videos. We have this side, and then we're gonna break this off on this side and do it a little bit better here. Hopefully you see that that's a five. Yeah, that's a five. Okay, and then I'm just gonna do the left side. Uh, take tend to favor the left side. We're gonna keep breaking it down recursively, and then we're gonna do this side as well until, as you can imagine. Then. Cool. All right, so this left side is completely broken down. We cannot break this array down any further just simply because we're down to our singletons down here, just one single element. And now at this point, we're going to focus our attention on just this one over here. Now, we are hit the bottom of this recursion tree, and what we need to do is, what merge sort is going to do is it's now going to sort this list of numbers. And how it's going to do that is it's given this left side and this right side. And if it's a singleton like this, you got two singletons, you can easily determine if they're in sorted order, where sorted order means ascending order in my case. And we can just say, okay, is this less than this one? Is the left less than the right? And we see three and one. That's not ascending order. That's out of order. And so simply we can swap them. And if we can swap, then we can change this list to be equal to one and then three. Okay. And if we change this list to be equal to 1 and 3, I'm actually going to do that. Let me do some erasing here. I'm going to redraw this. This is an easy one to do, 1 and 3. We're just going to resort it and, you know, leaving that apart. And then we're just going to return it up. And then these right here, they're in sorted order, and so no need to do any swapping. We're going to return that back up. And now let's focus our attention on solving this part. And this is where the merge comes in. So I'm going to write, I'm going to do a little box over here. 
where we're going to talk about merge. Okay, the merge step. And now at this step right here, right, this step right here, what's going to happen is that we're given two arrays. We're giving one and three, which is in sorted order. And then you're given two and four, which is also in the sorted order. And then how do we, the, the, the idea here is that at this step, right, at this step right here, we need to figure out how to merge these into a single array such that it's in sorted order. And maybe I can draw a better array than that. And so a single array that's in sorted order. One, two, three. Awesome. And how we're going to do that is we're going to have a counter, we have a pointer here, sorry, not a counter. And we're going to have a pointer here and then a pointer here. This is going to be I and this is going to be J. And then at this point, we need to fill in this spot. This spot is reserved for the smallest item in these two arrays. And since they're both in sorted order, and since this is the smallest item in this array, this is the smallest item in this array, then we need to pick the smaller of these two to go here. And we say, okay, uh, the I counter, wherever I is right here, the I pointer, this is going to be the one that's smaller because it's smaller than two. So I is smaller than J. And so we're gonna add one right here. Okay, and then we're gonna move our pointer over. And then we're also going to move our I pointer over as well. And then we make the same thing. We don't do anything to J because we haven't added it anywhere. And we say, okay, what needs to be here? It's gonna be the second smallest element in both of these arrays. And it says, okay, is I less than J? No, that's not the case. Three is actually greater than two. And so J is the smallest. And so we're gonna add that one in. And then, let me, sorry. We're gonna add that one in. And then we're gonna scooch our uh, pointer over here. And we're also going to scooch J as well. And we say is I less than J, and yes it is. So we're gonna add I here. And now I is falling off the end of the array. And at this point, what we do know is that all of these is are, are done. And then everything that is left over here in this other array, imagine it was bigger and it had more items. They are going to be greater than everything that is right here. And so what we do is we add them in. And so we add four in, and then we're done. And then what happens is this array right here winds up being you know, one, two, three, and four, just like this, and that gets returned up, and then we do the same thing. And so that's the merge procedure, and that's how this algorithm breaks the problem up down into smaller and smaller subproblems, and then solves it from the way up. It just rec recursively divides it, and then on its way up, it merges and sorts, merges and sorts, merges and sorts, until eventually the entire array will be sorted. And that's why it's called merge sort. And so let's analyze this algorithm, right? We need to figure out what is its runtime. Well, it's a divide and conquer algorithm, and you know it can actually the running time of it can be represented like such. And why can it be represented like such? Well, you got to think at each step you're going to take this array, you're going to break it in half. Okay, so there's two recursive subproblems that's going to continue getting broken, and so. Since this spot is reserved for how many subproblems at each level, we know we're going to have two, so we're good there. We know that we're breaking each subproblem in half, so n over 2 is correct. The, the half of this subproblem is going to be passed into the function again and recursively done, you know, recursively divided. And then what we're going to do is at each level, if you look at this merge procedure, right, we, we had to, at the very least, iterate through every item in this array, every item in this array. And so if we are passed in at any given moment, a subproblem of size n, we're going to have to do n work just to merge and sort this array. And so f of n is n. And you can already say, you already see that I'm going to use the master method. a is equal to 2, b is equal to 2, right? And then f of n is equal to n. And we, you know, we start by figuring out what n log b of a is. This is going to be n log 2 of 2, which is 1. And so that's going to be n f of n is equal to n, so we're in case 2. Please review the master method if that is uh, if you cannot remember. And case 2 says that if we fall into case 2 and f of n is equal to n, then this algorithm's running time is theta of n log n, where log is just log base 2. And this right here is the asymptotic running time of merge sort. And so I know that that was a very high level overview of mer merge sort, but the general idea is such. Take an array, split it in half. If you have an odd number of elements, pick the lower or the upper bound wherever you split in terms of like, you know, either this one or this one. 
uh, because there's going to be an odd number on each side and hopefully you can manage the edge cases and we'll do it until you get down to singletons and then as things start popping up you're going to start merging and then they pop up and you start merging and you pop up and you merge you merge and sort and then eventually you know you're going to get this one that pops up right here for the bigger problem and then this one's going to pop up sorted like five six seven and eight and in this case well they come back sorted and so we just merge them back together you know there's not really that much to do here and so that is uh, how merge sort works so in this video we're going to start our series on data structures and their operations and we're going to talk about right now a linked list um, it's a fundamental data structure data structure and so we've talked about what an array is i think that's that's something that's pretty uh well known in our on our minds it's well imprinted but this is how we've sort of represented an array uh, where we have a set of like sequential elements you know sometimes they're in sorted order and sometimes they're not uh, we talked about some algorithms for putting them in sorted order and and we know that you know in this case a of zero i can write a better zero is going to be equal to two and then a of two is going to be equal to three and that's sort of how an, that's actually how an array um, is able to in, you know grab certain elements out of it. It's a it's a it's an, a data structure that does so. Well, a linked list is sort of similar, um, and and but it's a little bit different. You know what a linked list is. If I wanted to draw a linked list of two one three four, a linked list first starts off with a pointer called head, and head is going to point to the first item in the list, and so this is going to be two, right? And two is going to contain uh, another pointer to the next item in the list, and that's going to be the item number one. Here's one, and then one is going to contain a pointer to the next item in the list, which is three, and then three contains a pointer, and then we contains a pointer, three contains a pointer to four, and then four contains a pointer, but it points to nil, nothing. And so this marks the end, and head always going to give you head will always give you this the item that's at the at the start. And so head, if you were to like if this were implemented in a programming language of your choice, and you made a call to you know linked list dot head, this should return two, right? It should return this node, and so that's what that's going to be. And this is what's actually called a singly linked list. A singly linked list is only one link between each chain, or each, each link in the chain. And a doubly linked list is going to have a pointer uh, that points back, right? And so each of these is going to have a pointer that points to the node previous to it. And that is a doubly linked list. Uh, because there's a there's a next pointer like this pointer points to next and this pointer points to prev and you can traverse the list that way now there's a few operations you can do on it uh, now you can you know i'm gonna write them uh, over here operations all right ops you can insert obviously we need to be able to insert items into this list and traditionally you don't have to do it this way you can once you know how to build a data structure you can do whatever you want to with it as long as it uh, fits your use case but insert usually traditionally is done at the beginning of the list and so if I wanted to insert an item like number the number six what I would do is I would you know then I'm gonna actually I'm gonna keep it this way because it's actually gonna be helpful I'm gonna rearrange these pointers right here so that head right head now points to the item number six okay and six points to two Okay, and so on. It points back and six points to head. But it's just a matter of rearranging these pointers. And so it's O of one. Insert is O of one. It, it really rearranging pointers is so so simple for a computer. It's so fast that it's just we consider it to be taking one, you know, one step or up to some constant step. It could be like two or three, but we really say O of one because you know it's how we represent it. And search. You know, I really need to be able to find an element. If you want to say, where's the number three and what's after number three, we need to have a way of searching through this list to find three and, and maybe see what it points to next. And the, the way that you find things is you, you know, you start from the head, unless you have a pointer at the tail, but you start from the head and you sort of, you know, traverse pointers, you follow pointers until eventually you get to number three and then it's 
returned. And so that is how search works. And if we were going to do in a linked list, the asymptotic running time of search is going to be linear because worst case scenario, we got to go all the way to the end of the list could search for the number four. Or worst case scenario, it's not in there at all, not there at all. And then we wind up just following pointers until we get to nil and then finding out it's not in there. And then we need to be able to delete an item from a, um, from the list. And deleting an item, you can imagine if we wanted to delete the not item number four and we did not have any pointer pointing to the tail here, um, or if we, you know, just worst case scenario, we have to delete an item that's at the end of the traversal. And so that is going to be O of n time as well. And so this is a linked list. These are nodes, these are pointers. And a linked list is a, is a chain of nodes where each node in the chain contains some data, which is a number in our case, and a pointer to the next node in the chain. And so what is a famous linked list? A famous linked list is actually the blockchain itself. The blockchain, you know, is, you know, is made famous by cryptocurrency mainly, is, you know, a set of blocks that contain some data, which are transactions, and they contain pointers to previous items in the list. And it's literally just a really big linked list. And so when you when you hear about the blockchain, just remember it's a, it's a linked list, you know, and that kind of makes it less intimidating, you know, now that you know what a linked list is.
So in this video, I want to talk about hashing. Um, and if we want to talk about hashing, we need to talk about uh, you know what a hash map is. You'll commonly see uh, hashing in general, like the concepts of all the components of a hash hash table and just hashing in general be referred to as a hash map. And the idea is that we, why it's called a hash map is that you know we have some universe of items and they're particularly referred to as keys. They could be numbers, they could be people's information, it can be anything. It could be like the information for a car. Um, you know, like people's information can be like the users of our product. And we have a universe of them. And what we want to do is we want to create a function, okay, and this is commonly referred to as a hash function, right? That's going to take in a key like such. And then what it's going to output is the desired or the appropriate location of this key in a table where the table consists of slots. You can think of this as it's commonly implemented as an array. But we have this key right here. We put it into this hash function. This hash function outputs an index for a particular slot in this table where we should place this key. And let's name it number one. Well, number one should go here. And then it's going to do the same thing for all the keys. Let's see, we're going to call this number three. And number three is going to go, let's say it says we need to go here, number three. And it's going to do that for all the keys, and it's going to keep storing them in this table such that if you need to look up the information for this object, which is just the number one in our case, it's very simple, you can take that object, put it into the hash function, and then look it up in this table, and then it should return you the information that you need. And so this is the general idea we have of, of what hashing means. We have a hash table. I can write that a little better. hash table. We have our keys, we have our hash function. And the thing is, is that with, with hash tables and hashing in general, you run into some problems. And you're probably wondering, uh, hey, what happens if I have two objects over here in our, our universe of keys that wind up, you know, just so happen, they wind up, like say this is number four, wanting to be put in the same slot. And what this is called right here, this is called a collision. And so this is a collision. And that's intuitive to think about um, what a collision is. It's two items colliding into the same spot in a hash table. And this is a common problem in hashing. And of course, people have solved this and they have, well, they have solutions for this. And uh, there's, there's two common collision handling techniques. There is actually quite a bit of ways to handle uh, collisions, but in this course, we're only going to go through the two major ones that I can think of, right? So the first one is chaining. You will hear this a lot. And what is chaining? Well, chaining is such. So I'm going to draw another uh, universe of keys over here. I'm going to draw another uh, hash function. Okay. And then I'm going to draw another table. Cool. And we're going to take a key in and we're going to produce a, a, an index for it in our table. And instead of storing it just in this slot, what's going to happen is, is there's going to be a linked list stored in this table. So if this is the number seven, number seven is going to be here. And this whole slot right here is just going to be a linked list. And every slot is going to be a linked list such that if I have another number like over here, like three that just so happens to go into our hash function and wind up in the same spot then what I'm gonna do is you know I can insert at the back but that's gonna take a long time what I can do is just insert three at the front like we talked about normally is done in linked list and in, in linked list and then store seven here so that it's an O of one insert all I have to do is rearrange this pointer right here to point to three and then the, the three's next pointer to point to seven and so that is what chaining is, and that's commonly how, that's, that's probably the most common uh, collision handling technique that I've seen. The second one that I think is a close competitor, it, you know, depending on who you are, you may have seen this one more than, than, than chaining, but the next one is going to be called, um, it's called linear 
probing. And linear probing falls under the more general category of probing in general. Um, you know, there's quadratic probing. And so the general, the idea here is that I'm gonna draw another set of keys. Um, and here's our universe of keys. We do have a hash function. Okay. But our hash function is actually a little bit different. Our hash function here just, you know, we didn't care in chaining. We just, if it hashed to the same slot, we just inserted it into this, it's into this uh, chain or this linked list. And that's how we dealt with collisions. But here, the hash function has to be a little bit different. And here's why. Let me draw my table. Because let's just say that there is the number seven that gets put right here. Okay, we're gonna go ahead, if, if number seven is here, we're gonna take it, put it into the hash function, and then store it in the actual slot. Now let's just say that number three comes along, and number three uh, collides with seven. And we don't like that. So we don't like that when we're doing linear probing. So, so what we do is we have a hash function uh, that's going to be like this. It's gonna take in the key, which is three in our case, and then some index, which is going to be like a number that's like one greater than what we're at. So like um, if we were doing seven, right? So like this is how it would go. If we were doing seven, it would be like the hash of seven with i equal to zero, right? And then that would get us right there into that slot. Well, then we did three. We did the hash of three with i equal to zero. And, and we, we made a mistake there because we, we, we produced a collision. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the hash of three and we're gonna increment i by one, i equal to one. And then maybe that gets us you know, over here some way. Maybe it doesn't get us to the next slot, but maybe it gets us to a slot. Um, depending upon where the ha what the hash function is, it could put you anywhere in this table, uh, but maybe it puts you right here. And so you can think of it as like, okay, what if we have another one, let's say the number five, that comes in, and five first hashes to seven. All right, I'm gonna give myself a little bit more space, but let's just say that we do hash five when i is equal to zero, and it goes to the same spot where seven is, and we don't like that because that's a collision and we're doing linear probing, and so we increment a little bit, and now we do five i equals one, and we do that, and then just unluckily enough, we hit three, and we're like, okay, we have another collision, and that's not cool. And so we do a hash of five, where we increment i one more time. And then maybe we get lucky, and it puts us right here. And now we found a slot for, for five. And so it's called like probing, because you'll commonly see it like, what happened was is that five initially started here and said, oops, I can't, I can't go there. So we incremented i one time by one more and it moved here and then it said, oops, I can't do that. And so we incremented I one more time and it moved here. And this idea of hopping from slot to slot, it's called probing. And we're doing it in a linear fashion because we're only incrementing I by one each time. So let's talk about a few of the operations that uh, a hash table or a hash map in general should support. And so the first one, I'm gonna write down operations. The first one is pretty obvious. obvious. We should be able to insert an item into the table. I can write a better T than that. Alrighty. And so inserting it is very, you know, we've already talked about that, but what is the runtime of this operation? So if we use chaining, if we use chaining, the, the runtime is just going to be O of 1 if chaining. And that should make sense, you know, we're, we're inserting this item into a linked list, a singly linked list in our case, and and we only have to rearrange the pointers up at the front here, right? So like, here's our linked list. We only had to rearrange these pointers. And so inserting into a linked list, we've already seen is O of one. If we are doing linear probing though, the runtime is going to be this right here, one over one minus alpha, if we're doing linear probing. Now, what is alpha right here? Alpha is what is called the load factor. So alpha is the load factor okay and it's just it's going to be the number of items that are in the table divided by the number of slots in the table and so in a linear probing sense you know this is literally going to be since there's no chain the number of slots that are occupied and so the the more slots that are occupied the more likely it is that you're going to probe to a slot that's already occupied probe to a slot that's already occupied and it's going to take longer to insert and so as alpha gets bigger 
um, you know, as we as the more proportion of our you know table gets filled up with more and more items, then this number right here gets smaller, which makes this get bigger, and so the runtime increases. And so that's a little bit on the load factor that's going to come into play whenever we are talking about analyzing operations here. So let's put a box around that. Now we should be able to delete an item. Obviously we should be able to delete and, and that is going to be um, roughly, okay, so if we have a, we're using a singly linked list here. So we're using a singly linked list. And so if we want to delete an item, we're first going to have to create a hash for it and then search in the linked list for it. And so the running time of that is going to be this. It's going to be one plus alpha, which alpha is the load factor. And that's if we're using chaining, if we are using chaining. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, if we're using chaining, N, N over M is just the average size of each linked list. If we have N equal 20 and M equal to 10, you know, 10 slots and 20 items, then on average, you know, we should see roughly two items, you know, per linked list because 20 items divided by 10 is two. And so if we're, we have to really think about this on an average case here, and that means that we're going to spend O of one time just hashing to the slot and then O of alpha time you're looking for it right and so that's why delete is o of one plus alpha now and i'm gonna leave this up if we're using linear probing then the running time is still going to be the same as insert and the logic is going to be the same as well if we are going to do finding finding is going to have the same time as deleting for chaining one over uh, one plus alpha and it's the same logic if chaining and it's going to be a little bit different for uh, linear probing. It's going to be one over alpha natural log of one minus one, one over one minus alpha. And so there's a proof for this online. It's way too lengthy here, but I wanted to give you these operations along with the running times. And I believe now you have a decent idea of what a hash map is. In this video, I want to talk about binary search trees. A binary, let me do that again, a binary search tree. So what is a binary search tree? And so it is a it is a tree of nodes. I'm going to do it by an example. It is a tree of nodes where every node, this is a node right here, every node's left child is less than or equal to it. And so this is valid, less than or equal to it. And every node's right child is greater than or equal to it. Six, And so this is a perfectly valid binary search tree. And so every binary search tree has a root node. And so this is the root of the tree. It is the topmost node. And so, you know, if I was to draw this tree out a little bit more, still satisfying the binary search tree property, this is greater than or equal to the node above it. Uh, this one right here is less than or equal to the node above it. And we don't actually need this node. We could draw another, we could write another node like this, but we don't need it. This is a perfectly good binary search tree that just this node is missing a right child. And so there are, um, there's a root, uh, there is, um, let's say the, this, if the node is x, x dot left is less than or equal to x, and then x right is gonna be greater than or equal to x, and every node, let's see, x has uh, less than or equal to two children. And this is the BST property right here. This is the BST property, and these, these rules right here satisfy a binary search tree. And so the height, the height is something that it's definitely, you know, something to talk about um, because a lot of the times the running time of an algorithm on the binary search tree like insert or search or delete is characterized by the height. And so the height of the tree is going to be the number of edges from the root to the long to the furthest child. And so here the furthest child, I mean, all of these are on the same level, you know, these nodes down here, which are called the leaf nodes. And so these nodes right here are called leaf nodes because they have no children and they're at the bottom of the tree. 
and the number of edges one two is is the first they all have the same number of edges and the number of edges is two and so the height of our tree here is going to be equal to two but let's just say for instance we had a number uh, let's say we wanted to insert the number six again and so um, or let's just say yeah let's just say we wanted to insert the number five five would work too six would work it really doesn't matter but if we want to insert the number five well we would start from the root and we'd say hmm five is greater than or equal to five and we go down here and then we say hmm five is less than or equal to six right and so we go down here and we say five is less than or equal to six and then we would insert five down here now if that really happened then the height of our tree okay was two beforehand it is no longer two the height of our tree is now equal to three because the longest path and i'm going to change my color to red here the longest path the longest number the, the longest path from the root to a, to a leaf node is now three edges and so it's one two three and then this right here is the new height of our tree and so that's a little bit about the height a little bit about the bst property and a little bit about binary search trees. So in this video, I wanna talk about dynamic programming and I'm gonna do that through a concrete example. And so the concrete example that I chose is a classic problem in computer science and in dynamic programming called rod cutting. And so what you're, what you're given as input is a rod. It could be a steel rod, a, a steel rod of length N, right? It has some length and you get, you're giving some price table, you're given some price table P. That, that's going to tell you how much money you can get for selling a rod of a particular length. And so your goal with this algorithm is to find the maximum revenue made by optimally cutting this rod. And so dynamic programming is mainly used in optimization problems. We're trying to find the optimal revenue that we can get from cutting a rod in this case. And also it's used for pro solving problems that it's the solution, an optimal solution to the problem depends on the optimal solution to smaller subproblems. And those subproblems tend to overlap. And I'm gonna show you what it means for it to overlap in just a second. But in our case, right, we have a rod and we're trying to find the maximum revenue we can get from optimally cut it. Now, let's think about this. What um, how, what, what would, if we were dreaming for a second, what would be the most optimal cut? Let's imagine we had found an actual cut of this rod that was optimal. Well, I'm going to give you an inarguable fact. An inarguable fact is, is that we had, if we had found one, we had first cut off the rod of a particular length I, and then we had somehow found a way to optimally cut the remainder of the rod. And that right there is what causes us to now say, all right, what is the optimal solution to this problem right here? Well, let's take it, right? Let's bring it down. And we can say the same thing about this remaining portion of the rod. We can say, well, if I found an optimal cut to this rod right here, I would have first cut the rod initially at a certain length, I, and then I would have found an optimal way to cut the remainder of the rod n minus i at this point. Well, we can do the same thing there, which take the remainder and then use the same logic, right, until we get down to a point where it's just so tiny that, that we can solve it trivially. Now, this reminds you of divide and conquer, but it is not divide and conquer because in divide and conquer, we have disjoint subproblems. When we broke the array up into two different parts and merge sort, the first half of the array had nothing to do with the right half of the array. They're, they're separate and they're disjoint. But in dynamic programming, chances are, you know, you're going to have to solve, like, what is the optimal cut of a rod of length three, for example? And you may have already solved it beforehand. And so dynamic programming is going to make sure that you're only going to solve the rod length of a particular length one time. You're only going to solve a subproblem one time and you're never going to do it again. And the approach that we're going to use here is a bottom up approach where we start from the smallest one and then move up versus our traditional way of starting from the biggest one and then moving down. And so the best way to do that is with an example. And so I'm going to fast forward a little bit and then we're going to start with our example. 
Okay, so here we have our price table. This is our price table right here. And we also are given a, a, a length, a rod of length four. And so it's a really small example. And so imagine this is our rod right here. There are a lot of different ways that we can cut this rod. We can cut it up, you know, we can just leave it the same, right? Let's just say we left it the same in this instance, we left it the same. Well, we can, uh, you know, we, can, we know that it's of length four if we left it the same and we didn't cut it at all. And in our price table, it says that if we have a rod of length four, we can get six dollars. And I'm gonna use dollars, so you can use any set of currency. But I'm, we're gonna get six dollars for this. And so there's many ways to cut this rod. We can just cut off the first piece and then leave the remaining three the same without cutting them at all. And we know that for a rod of length one, we can get you know one dollar here, and then a rod of length three, we can get four dollars here, and so we can get approximately five dollars here. We can get actually we can get five dollars here. And there's many more ways. You know, we can cut it uh, into individual little pieces, you know, and just get one dollar for each one to get four dollars. But the thing is, is that there is going to be a cut of all the different possible ways you can cut a rod. There's going to be a, be a particular cut. It's going to give you the most revenue. And so in this case, if these were the only three, which they're not, then we could just leave the rod along and sell it as is and be just fine. And this is an actual, one of the actual optimal solutions to this problem. So let's step through the algorithm real, real quick and learn uh, how this actually works. So I'm gonna clean up my space a little bit. And so how this algorithm is gonna work is that it's based off of a recurrence relation where we're pretty much saying that the rod of any particular length n is going to be equal to the price of initially cutting that rod, right? initially cutting that rod of some particular length, and it's gonna be plus the maximum revenue we can get from the remaining from the remaining rod. And that is an inarguable fact that we just, we discussed about it pr previously, but if I found an optimal solution, well, I'm telling you what, it's gonna be, I'm gonna initially cut it at a particular length. I'm gonna take my first cut like this and cut it, and then I'm gonna have to find an optimal way to cut the remainder. And then this recurrence relation is saying that I can literally just recurse and use that same logic on this problem, the same way we did merge sort. And so what you're going to do is you're, you're going to want to iterate over all uh, I, you know, all the way from one up to N. You're gonna to wanna to first consider, well, let's cut at length one, right? And then let's figure out the remainder. remainder. And then you wanna try um, cutting at length, let's say two, right? and then figuring out the remainder. And you're gonna keep doing that all the way up to N. But we're gonna do it in a bottom-up fashion so that we don't have to start on the entire rod itself. We can just start on really tiny sub-problems like a rod of length one or two, and then work our way up to solving the major problem. I'm, I'm gonna have a table called R, and R is gonna store the most optimal solution to rods of a particular length, one, two, three, and four. And Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to first start off with solving the problem of size equal to one, right? We have a, we're going to start from the smallest possible problems, and the smallest problem is a rod of length one. You can't go any smaller. And so what is the most optimal solution to a problem of size one? Well, let's imagine if we did have one, right, we would have to cut it. I'm going to call this R1. We'd have to cut it at P of one, right? And you can cut it at P of zero if you want, but cutting it at P of one is just leaving it the same in this case, right? And so, um, but we're gonna cut it at P of one and then we're gonna find an optimal solution to the remainder, which doesn't exist in this case. And so it's gonna be zero. And we're just going to look up the price for a rod of length one, which is just one. And so in this case, the, the only solution is going to be one. And so that's not that exciting, but I guess it sort of warms us up to the logic. And then now, we're gonna look up size equals to two. Well, now it's starting to get a little bit more interesting, right? So we have a rod of length two. Okay, and first we're gonna consider, what if we cut right here? Well, if we cut right here, that's gonna be cutting a rod of length one. Let's say this is going to be R, an R1 here. This is different from the R1 up here. But this is gonna be saying, okay, let's first cut at the first inch or the first, of, or the first one and then we're gonna solve the remainder. Well, that's gonna be the price we can get for this rod of length one, plus the optimal solution to the remainder here. And well, the remainder here is of length one. We've already solved that optimal solution, so we just look it up. We know what the price of, of, of a, a rod of length one is. It's in this table. And so this is gonna be one plus one equal to two. And now we're gonna iterate again. 
And so we're going to take our little pointer and we're going to move it over here. And we're going to say, all right, well, what if we just, you know, cut at the end? What if we just leave it alone and don't do anything? We don't cut it at all. Well, that's going to be the price of having a rod of length 2 plus an optimal solution to the remainder, which doesn't exist. And the price of a rod of length 2 is going to be equal to 3. And so we have 3 here, 3 here. And then we have the maximum revenue we can get of size 2 is going to be 3. It wins here. So 3 wins here. And now we're going to move on. And hopefully you see how this is building on top of itself. So our rod of length one, two, three. And so hopefully this isn't confusing you, this, this one here, uh, this R one here, but I'm gonna change this to C, to say we cut at this length. And I think that's a lot more uh, descriptive. So let's imagine we cut at one here on a rod of size three. Well, that's gonna be, we're gonna get the price of a rod of length one, which you have in our table, our price table up top, plus the revenue from a rod of length two, the remainder. What we've already know is an optimal cut of two. We've already solved that problem, right? It's three. And we know what the price of the length one is. We can look it up in our table. And so this right here is gonna give us four. And now we go over here and we say, all right, well, what's the optimal revenue we can get from a broad of length, first cutting at length two? It's gonna be the price of two plus the remainder, which is the price of a rod of the optimal cut of length one, which is just selling it as is. And that's going to be uh, three, because we can look it up in our table, and then one, because we have the R table that we've already solved, and that's gonna be four. And then we're gonna scooch our pointer over and just consider selling it as is, which is gonna be the price of a rod of length three plus the remainder, which doesn't exist. Look that up in our price table, and that's gonna be four. And right here, all of these are of length, all of these have a price of four. And so the maximum revenue you can get from a rod of length three is going to be four. And in our case, you know, this, this winds up giving you the same output as the price table, but you still see the logic of building up from size one, size two, size three, and how you can use them, you know, because you've already solved them and put them into this table right here, this R table. And so size four, this is going to be iterating over the entire array. And so we have, si we imagine, let's imagine we cut at one. This can be the price of one plus the remainder, optimal remainder, which is just the optimal solution for three, cut of, uh, optimal cut of three, which we already got, it's four. And so the price of one is one plus four is gonna be five. Okay, and then we cut at two. Okay, and that's gonna be the price of two plus the remainder of two. And that's gonna be three plus, three, which is going to be six. And then C3 is we're going to cut at three. And that's going to be the price of having a rod of length three plus the remainder, which is just one. And that's going to be four plus one, which is five, right? And so now we finally just consider leaving it as is and just selling the whole thing. It's going to be the price of a rod of length four plus the remainder, which doesn't exist. And that's going to be, looking it up in our price table, six. And so these right here, are the most optimal solutions to the entire rod, and we have solved our problem. In this video, I want to introduce the graph data structure and then two searching algorithms that are uh, fundamental to graphs. And I believe if you understand what the data structure is and then how these two searching algorithms work, all the other graph algorithms that you see will start to make a lot more sense to you. And so what is a graph? Um, as always, let's start with an example. And so a graph is commonly represented as such, where we have um, a set of nodes. So these are nodes, this is, you know, we can label them with some letter. And these nodes, they're connected through these edges. And so this is an edge, this is an edge, this is an edge. And these edges can be directed or undirected. And an undirected edge means there's no uh, arrow. You know, there's no pointer. Uh, they're just connected and it's a two-way street. You can get from B to C and from C to B. It's undirected, either way works. However, a directed graph is a little bit different where you now have arrows that tell you where to go in the graph. And so here you can't get from C to B because that edge does not exist. You can only get from B to C because that is what the directed edge tells you. And so that's why it's called a directed graph because the edges direct you. An undirected graph, the edges don't direct you and everything, every edge is a two-way street. 
And so that is a graph. And also you'll commonly hear like the nodes be referred to as vertices. And, and that's, uh, that's another name for them. But let's talk about our first um, search algorithm. And so graph, graphs are, you know, famous for, you know, things such as social networks, representing social networks where the nodes are users and the edges represent some sort of connection. Maybe uh, they are friends on, on some sort of platform where they're following each other. And as you can imagine, you would want to be able to search you know, through this graph and find certain nodes or certain objects in this graph and to see what they're, you know, related to and what they're connected to. And so this is why we want to search through graphs. The first one is called breadth first search or BFS for short. And so BFS is an algorithm that, you know, it's, it says, you know, its name really tells you what it does and what you're going to do is you're going to process a network starting from our graph from some node I'll label this s you're going to process it in such a way that you process it as layers and so let me draw this graph that i have real quick and so i fast forwarded a little bit to draw the graph um, but you're going to start from some starting node let's simply say s and i'm going to change colors and so you're going to start from s and then you're 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 gonna process this this network in in layers, you know. So maybe you may do this. You may then process C, and then you may process, you know, D and then F, D E and F. And so you're gonna you're gonna do a breath. You're gonna start at S, and then you're gonna look at what other what other nodes it's connected to, and you're gonna see that it's connected to A and B. And then you're going to search through A and B and see what they're connected to, and well, they're all connected to to these right here. And then you're going to you know, go to these nodes and see what they're connected to. And well, they're connected to F. And at this point, you've explored every node in the graph. And you don't need to do anything else. You're done. And you fully explore the graph. The graph. Congratulations. And then the algorithm terminates. And so, so let's implement breadth first search on this graph. And so you're going to make use of two data structures. You're going to make use of a queue to keep track of where you're at and what you've explored. You're going to use also um, another a hash map that's going to uh, store nodes like S and whether it's actually been explored or not. And so what happens is, is we start off at S, right? And so we start off at S and so we add S to the queue. It's a first in, first out. So S is first in line. And this is where the head is pointed. And this is where the tail is if you remember, but I'm not gonna draw them out explicitly like that. You're gonna to have to sort of keep it in your head. And then we're gonna say, okay, S, we have explored it. Remember, this is keeping track of explored. Okay, and so what you're gonna do is you're then gonna look at S's neighbors. And you're gonna say, okay, S, S is connected to A and B. And so what you do is you add A and B to the queue and mark them as explored. So A has been explored b has been explored because we've already touched them and then what we're going to do is we're going to decide okay which one do we go to next and explore its neighbors and so let's just say because we chose a to go in first we're going to choose a and then we choose a and then we're like okay well what is a's neighbors well we see that a is connected to s and b but we first need to say, okay, look, we are just searching through all nodes. We don't need to search the same node twice. Um, and we've already seen that they've been explored. And so let's not add them to our queue yet. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the ones to the queue that we haven't explored yet, which are C and then D. And so we are going to add C and D to the, to the queue. Okay, keeping here. And from here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore the next item in our list or in our queue. And then we go to B and then we go, okay, B. What is B connected to? B's connected to S, we've already explored it. B's connected to A, we've already explored it. B's connected to C, we've already explored it. And then B's connected to E, which we have not explored. And I almost forgot, we need to mark C and D as being explored. Okay, and then we go to and then what we do is we add E to our queue, and then we are going to move our pointer over in our queue, over here to C, and then we're gonna see, okay, 
what is C connected to? Well, C is connected to all, you know, A, but we've already explored it. C is connected to B, we've already explored it. C is connected to F, what we haven't explored, right? And so we're going to add F to the Q. And then we're going to keep iterating, right? We, we have to also mark E as being... When you add it to the queue, you need to mark it as explored. Okay, and now we have fully explored our graph. Um, we, you know, we're going to run this algorithm until eventually this pointer, you know, falls off the end. There's no items left in this queue, right? We're going to explore D, and we're going to realize that it's not connected to anything; hasn't been explored. And then we're going to iterate to E and see the same thing, and iterate to F and see the same thing, and then fall off the end of the. You know, there's going to be nothing left in the queue. And then explored this hash map we have over here is going to contain all the nodes in the graph, all of them that we've explored and we've processed them in, in such a way. And that is how breadth first search works. You have a queue, you have a hash map. If you're using Python, it's gonna be a dictionary of some sorts, and, you know, a dictionary, and you have a graph, and that's how you explore it. And then you just take explored, you, and, and now explored has all the nodes in the graph. So let's talk about depth first search. And so depth first search or DFS for short. And so depth first search is an aggressive exploration uh, algorithm. And so how it works, I'm gonna draw our, draw our graph modified a little bit. So this is our graph and we're gonna run depth first search on it. And so just like breadth first search, we do need to maintain some map that shows us what we've explored thus far. And unlike death first search is that we're going to use a stack instead of a queue to keep track of where we're at. Because as soon as we hit a node that has already been previously explored, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to backtrack. And how do we backtrack? We just keep track of the nodes that we have visited by throwing them onto the stack. And then once we throw a node onto the stack that's already been explored or is already on the stack or has already been explored, we're going to pop it off, right? And then go back to the node that was right under it. And so which is a node we just came from and then we're going to keep doing that so this is how it works i'm going to change colors so that we know where we're at it'll just help whenever we get to uh, actually doing this so we're say we start at s well we go over here and we're going to add s and set it equal to true and then we're going to add s to our stack and then let's just say from s we realize we can go to a or b and let's just say we go to a well we're going to go up here and we're going to say okay you've explored a Let's put A onto our stack. And then when we're at A, we're like, okay, let's say we're gonna go to um, D. And then if we go to D, right here, cool. And then we're at D, we can go to A or we can go to F. And let's just say we go to F. Okay. And then I forgot, just like I forgot in breadth first search, we have to keep on as we exploring it, Add the, uh, no, add the nodes to our explored map up here. And then we're at F, and then we realize we can go to C or E. And let's just say we go to C, okay? And we're gonna add C up here, and then add it to the stack. And then let's just say at C, we decide to go to A. But whoops, we cannot go to A, because A has already been explored right here. And so what we do is we take A off of the stack, and then we pop back straight back to C. And then here we take our turn, we turn our attention to B, and we go, has B been explored? No, it has not. And so we hop our way over there and we add B right here. And then we go over here to uh, B and we're like, okay, can we go to S? Well, we can go to S, but it's already been explored, but let's just keep it interesting and let's go hop over to E. And then we throw E onto the stack, we mark it as explored. Okay, and then from E we go to F. What happens at this point is items just start popping off the call stack. And so we're gonna start backtracking like crazy. We're gonna start going back here to E. So F is gonna come off the call stack just like this. And then we're gonna pop back to get to E. And then E is gonna get popped off the call stack, right? And then we're gonna hop back to B. And then B is gonna get popped off the call stack. And then we're gonna hop back to C. Well, actually, what can happen, and then at B, we're, we might actually try to traverse this. We would actually try to traverse this edge, and if we traverse this edge, we'll realize that S has already been explored. So we throw S onto the call stack, and then we pop it right back off, 
because we've already been explored. And so we're going to go back to B, and then we start back backtracking to C. 